And it's Ken Kreitzer for CBSI Services, and we're down in Lower Manhattan today talking with our friend John Mustin, who is CEO of Wasabi Rabbit, a digital agency. And John is also a career Navy officer. He balances both. John, good to see you. Ken, great to see you. Thanks very much for coming down. Our pleasure. Um, you're doing a lot, and uh, your agency here is growing. Beautiful spot here at Fulton Street. Tell us a little bit about your company, if you would. You got it. Well, Wasabi Rabbit is a digital agency, so we specialize in digital services, which run the gamut from social media, website design and development, back-end systems integration, and uh, harnessing big data to help clients make better decisions. So uh, that's that's quite a lot. It sounds like an awful lot, but really, I think if we if we tie a common thread through all that, it's how do we help brands create better, more interesting engagements with their customers online? Absolutely. And it's getting more complicated as you have multiple platforms to think about. Certainly Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter uh, are top of mind. What are some of the platforms that you, that you really see there's value for your clients to be visible on? Well, if you talk about social media, certainly you've hit some of the big ones. I mean, Facebook has such a wide, uh, wide breadth and exposure that if you're not there, you're missing out. Um, we feel the same way about Twitter. You know, it's just it becomes an amplifier or a vehicle for communications at low cost. Really, what we're talking about now is the opportunity to shape a narrative with customers or prospects in a way that doesn't require media expenditure. So, you know, a lot of uh, small companies, even growing companies, want to preserve their capital, and the best way to do that is not to take out ads in the Wall Street Journal. Now, I know my friends at the Wall Street Journal are going to hate me for saying it, but the reality is you can use social media in ways that create a leverageable springboard for great customer interaction or prospect interaction, and it doesn't cost you anything more than the cost of your people and the smart thinking that goes into the content that you want to share. Uh, those are two. I, I, you know, I would say also we're, uh, we're very active in, in the blog space, and that's another one where owning and shaping a narrative is, uh, is important because that's more long-form content. And then ultimately, if you're into video visual content, clearly you want to be in the kinds of applications and platforms that allow you to uh, to share imagery or short uh, video snippets. So, you know, I, I've, we've got Daniel here who's uh, our social media coordinator, but, but he will tell you that, you know, we look equally across a variety of different platforms. And, and know that each of those platforms has a different specialty and a different uh, raison d'etre. So in Facebook, it's, it's wide, diverse uh, applications to, to reach a lot of folks. If you want to talk about Twitter, obviously shorter, um, microscopic, microblogging. Um, when you look at what we do in Tumblr, longer form. Um, if you want to look at uh, more imagery, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a handful of different platforms that we use to share imagery. And then ultimately, there are then those kinds of platforms that tie it all together. So when it comes comes to social media content management, it's not easy to say that I want to dedicate a single person to each one of those platforms. So being smart about how you can manage each of those uh, efficiently becomes important too. So there are a handful of platforms and I, and I don't want to plug any one particular one, but we're familiar with most. Absolutely. And one of the things we see a lot of, and certainly I think Facebook is encouraging is, and that's certainly been uh, YouTube's uh, role, is video. Uh, to get a message out. A lot of manuals for products are now on YouTube and uh, and just the amount of video that's going out that can be used either uh, uh, across digital platforms or even websites. Um, how do you see the role of video helping helping your clients? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. And I didn't call that out explicitly, but you know, video is so critically important in any kind of storytelling. And so today what we see is uh, consumers are time compressed and they and they don't have uh, the capacity or interest anymore in reading long articles when you could tell the story instead in a 30 second video. And so what we love about the creative outlet that video provides is not only can you tell a story, but you can create a level of engagement. You can tell a great brand backstory as well. So there's the if, if you're talking about a product, for instance, clearly features and benefits are something that you want to call out. But ultimately, we will always start with what is the brand personality? that you want to communicate. Because what we know is, you know, uh, we, we published an interesting paper called uh, Rational Advertising is Dead, Neuroscience Killed It. And what that really talks to is y you don't have the opportunity now to make the case in advertising. 
because the attention span of today's consumer is so brief that they're going to make in a millisecond a decision about whether they want to listen or learn or pay attention to what you're saying. Video provides that outlet and you can do, you can shape conversations or communications in far more creative ways in video than you can in a print piece or in a piece of social content. So, so we love video. I think we, we always assume that video is the foundation for any great online campaign and then we'll provide the surrounding, you know, the surround sound in social media content uh, and that's dispersed elsewhere, but, but you got to have video. That's critical. Absolutely. One of the things that we're seeing in, in our work in direct marketing and certainly in, in uh, customer service uh, uh, work is trying to find the comments about your brand on social media platforms, perhaps a customer traveling that's having a, a, a problem, needs assistance, or many other aspects, or someone who's got a, uh, a negative about your brand uh, or service provided. And I know you've worked with uh, Sysmos, uh, which is a partner of CBSI. What are some of the ways and importances of, of being able to track what your customers are saying or may need from their comments on social media? Well, and this is another thing that you and I had talked off camera about, which is the evolution of not only marketing, but, but business. And so what we've seen with the use of platforms like Sysimos and others is that the ability to capture or preempt what might become a large public relations nightmare is, is critical. And tools like Sysimos or, or the product suite available by Sysimos are, are absolutely fundamental now to what has become the norm in customer service. And you see this with airlines you see it in retail establishments, having the opportunity to detect a disgruntled customer and engage a dialogue with him to preempt what might blow up later is, is fantastic because as they always say, an ounce of provision, prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, so Sysimos and its platform has, uh, has certainly enabled uh, a number of different kinds of businesses to take full advantage of social media content. And that's, it's not only sentiment, but it's what's being said in real time. And it's also uh, the ability to manage and, uh, and in some cases shape uh, something that could become uh, negative to your advantage. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're big fans of first order, second order, third order implications of influencers and social content. I just want to ask you, one of the trends we've been following are the tra real changes in retail, uh, the struggles of some of the traditional uh, large retail companies to hold on to their market, the growth of Amazon's, an article yesterday about uh, the growth of Walmart online. Uh, where do you see retail going? Uh, how do the is there a way for the traditional retailers to compete uh, with uh, the increasing amount of sales that are happening online? Well, I mean, what you're hinting towards now is just the evolution of consumer behavior. And, you know, there's, there's no secret in saying that it wasn't that many years ago where we were making recommendations to our um, B2C business consumer clients saying 10% of your revenue should come from online sales. That is exploding rapidly as things like bandwidth availability becomes better, as mobile experiences become better, as things like position-based advertising and marketing opportunities become better and more authentic and seamless, such that where I see this going is a larger and larger share of sales are going to be through online uh, online channels. Now, what does that mean for small mom and pop retailers? There's always going to be a place for local. And you know, you, I, everyone in my company, we love our local establishments. I mean, I, I love walking to the hole in the wall where I know everyone there. But there are certainly things where I feel that we take advantage of a global economy. And you know, Amazon is wonderful about being able to deliver immediately and and, and quickly, and they know my preferences, and they make great recommendations, they've got alg algorithmic uh, back-end engines who are helping us determine what we might also like as opposed to what we're buying today. So anyway, I, I think you're going to continue to see sales move online just because that's now where consumers are, are living. We're living online. We're digital people, and, and we've made, we and others have made it so easy with front and back-end systems that people would be foolish not to embrace it. Well, we want to uh, congratulate you on, uh, on your promotion. Uh, you've served in the United States Navy for uh, over two decades, and you're, you've been selected for promotion to Rear Admiral. It's going to happen uh, this fall, and we'll look forward to that. But it's amazing to see that someone in the Navy Reserve can hold on to the level of responsibility in the Navy and do all the things required and run a company 
uh, in a very vigorous competitive field like advertising. How, do, how have you been able to balance your work for the Navy with your you know, very vigorous uh, civilian career? Well, thanks, thanks for raising the point. Um, you know, the reality of this is, first, I've always served in the Navy because I love it. I went to the U.S. Naval Academy undergrad, and it's just been, you know, uh, there was a family heritage that, uh, that influenced my decision to go to the Naval Academy in the first place, and it's been great to serve both on active duty and as a reserve officer. But when it comes to balancing the time commitments for the Navy, I mean, it actually, it's, it's very easy because the Navy Reserve is incredibly flexible about how we serve. So most people are familiar with the minimum requirement, you know, they were, they were refer to it as uh, one week a month and two weeks a year. And, and that is, I mean, there are many folks that, that see that as the level of commitment they're capable of providing. And that's wonderful. We've got a lot of folks that, that do that. And the active duty component benefits tremendously by the number of folks of our roughly 60,000 people, uh, selected reserve and, and full-time support folks. Uh, but there are some, myself included, who are able to contribute more. And the reason I'm able to contribute more is because I've got a great team here. And it's no coincidence that the hiring practices that we employ at Wasabi are such that we're looking for people who uh, bring to the table the same kinds of attributes that you would seek in your military members. And so I like decision makers. I like folks who may not be uh, waiting for a perfect answer, but are able to execute with the best educated answer based on what we know today. You know, I, I have always been a firm believer in decentralized execution, and, and we may not call it that when, uh, when we're sitting around uh, our management meetings here, but, but people here are familiar with the idea that we agree on what we want to do, and then how we do it is really up to the individual team lead. And so uh, the short answer to your great question is I, I'm very fortunate to have great people here who can run and execute and deliver our client commitments when I may be down in Virginia, or I may be in California, or I may be in Texas or Florida doing and work uh, in uniform. So, so I've just, I've, I feel like I've got the best of both worlds. I mean, I love what I do at Wasabi. I love being with my teammates here. We've got great clients. We're doing some great innovative work in the digital space, in the creative messaging space, in the brand space. But I also love wearing a uniform and contributing to the, to the nation in that regard, too. Well, we appreciate that you do that and your commitment to uh, serving our country in the United States Navy. Uh, one of your passions, I know, is helping fellow veterans uh, with uh, with employment opportunities, with uh, transition. Uh, a lot of people, especially uh, we have a lot of Army friends uh, who have left the uh, uh, service in the, in the last couple of years. And is there, uh, w what are some of your thoughts about helping uh, and guiding fellow veterans uh, when, they, when they move uh, from the military to, uh, to the civilian and, uh, and are looking for opportunities? Uh, and this is another really important point uh, for our society. I mean, we're, we're looking at about 250,000 veterans per year who are entering the workforce. And after about a decade and a half of war, I mean, we're seeing more and more people who know veterans who are now seeking employment. So, you know, if you, f if you flash back about 15 years ago, especially in a place like Manhattan, many people probably knew someone who knew someone who was either in the military or had served in the military. Today, everyone knows someone or is related to someone. And again, that's the result of being at war for 15 years. So, so what we see now is there's this mass influx of great veteran talent that's hitting our workforce now. So, so there are a number of large scale initiatives. I mean, major commitments, um, veterans on Wall Street, vows, who have said, we're gonna hire 100,000 veterans. So, I mean, that's just one initiative, but there are literally hundreds of specialized placement agencies who are looking for reserve or uh, former military talent to help bring it. So they, they, they are mapping supply and demand and helping people in a LinkedIn style way online use great digital tools to find the right kind of match. One of the things that I would always offer too is there's been a significant shift in the way that hiring works today. Uh, you know, about five years ago, I think folks were saying, we're looking for someone with a track record and prior experience in exactly the job we want to fill. Uh, my conjecture is today that's, sh that's shifted now to instead I'm looking for someone who is adaptable and flexible and can think on their feet and deliver in ways and grow in ways that we may not be able to define today. So I've always characterized that as it's a shift from what to think to how to think. And if you as a hiring manager are looking for someone who knows how to think, there are very few people who are going to walk in the door who are better equipped to deliver against that than a former military member. So, so anyway, how do you help if you're seeking military members? You know, it, one thing you need to do is 
take a chance because you may say my hiring manager is looking for someone who did exactly this role and and I offer that if you're willing to open up the aperture a little bit and take someone who may not have the perfect experience but has all the attributes like camaraderie and leadership and an understanding and and understands culture and will contribute to it not just consume it then it's in your best interest to say I'm gonna hire someone who had previously worn the uniform and if you're a military member who's looking for a job I would say be persistent and don't think that your resume because it doesn't say specifically what you did maps to what that company you want to be hired by is looking for don't get discouraged because as soon as you get in the door, you're going to blow them away with what you say and do and the way you behave. Absolutely. And I remember my father, uh, well, I, I can appreciate what my father went through in his 40s when he left the Army after about 22 years service in the 1960s, you know, with the uh, two children in college and a youngster and myself. Uh, it's not easy, but uh, just, just again, what are the qualities? I mean, there's a veteran who comes out, one of the services has really done a lot of things that most people haven't done, maybe travel overseas, uh, maybe led significant numbers of people. Um, what, again, what are some of the values and, and special um, attributes that a veteran brings to uh, an employer? Well, it's great that you mentioned this. I mean, in, in the Navy, we talk about uh, honor, courage, and commitment. In the Army, we talk about duty, honor, and uh, country. When you, and you're in the Air Force, it's uh, service and excellence. I mean, th these are not just words on a poster. I mean, when you're in the service, these are words that mean something to you. So, so what does a military member bring to the table? I mean, you're going to see things immediately that you don't take for granted when you're hiring in the civilian force, but things like ethics and morality and responsibility and accountability. I mean, the, these, again, they're lofty words, but they're words that are drilled into every military member's head from the first day of boot camp or their service academy affiliation or officer candidate school or ROTC, but they, they learn to embrace it and they understand that people are counting on them. So, so you are going to bring people on board who have your back because they are going to trust you and you can trust them. You know, I, I always looked at things like uh, entrepreneurial um, attributes, which interestingly are born and raised and bred in the military. When you're wearing uniform, you have to be able to think on your feet. I mean, when you take lines in on a ship and you sail away and you're in the middle of the ocean, you don't have the luxury of calling somebody to solve your problems. If there's a fire on board, everyone who is a warfighter is also a firefighter. So, so anyway, thinking on your feet, being adaptable, being flexible, being someone who, who is cool under fire. And you know, this is another thing that we talk about here. Even on the worst day at Wasabi Rabbit, I can say, you know what, no one's shooting at us. So, so while we take our job very seriously and we do a great job with it, we also are able to prioritize it appropriately. So when people may be running around with their hair on fire, our team is able to say, okay, let's just pause and take a deep breath, understand there's a problem, determine how we want to address it, and move on. We learn from our failures and we come back stronger, but we're not going to freak out and we're not going to drop the or drop the ball. So, um, so anyway, those are those are a lot of great attributes. Any one of which I think you'll find with everybody who's ever worn a uniform. I think there's so many uh, uh, firemen and policemen in New York City and across the country that are also have been or are currently members of the military, and we we thank them for their service. John, um, when I was in banking around uh, this time, we'd have a meeting saying, what else can we do this year to uh, increase revenue? And uh, obviously for retail, as we talked about earlier, uh, the fourth, you know, the back to school and uh, even Halloween and then all of the, uh, uh, the holidays uh, are so important for, for driving sales. Is there um, uh, kind of a, a trend or a thought that you have for your clients about how, what they need to be thinking about to uh, plan for the balance of the year? Absolutely. So uh, notwithstanding the fact that there are those episodic opportunities when holidays come about and planning for promotional elements associated with holidays is important, but generally the, the overarching message or, um, or contribution that I would offer is having a, an integrated experiential um, approach to interacting with your clients or prospects is the most valuable thing you can do. And what does that mean? It means that your marketing and advertising campaigns shouldn't be matching luggage necessarily. It doesn't mean your print ad needs to look like your web page, but it means that the experience that people walk away from having interacted with your brand should be consistent. So, so there are a number of best of breed agencies, and this is also kind of an evolution from where we were about a decade ago where an agency of record owned everything about the marketing and advertising of uh, 
uh, of their clients. Today, it's typical for the agency of record to own the strategy, but when it comes to developing the surround sound experience of how does the brand represent itself on social, how does it in other digital channels, how does it online and broadcast on radio and TV and elsewhere, you know, the, the idea is don't miss the opportunity to create the engagement that is consistent because that's the reinforcing element that's going to make people fall in love with your brand and best yet it's going to make them become ambassadors for your brand so so if i could create an opportunity for someone to not only love you know products by uh, brand xyz most importantly they can tell their friends about it so so creating ambassadors trumps creating a one time customer so the way you do that of course is by having a consistent message and and by creating consistent experiences that uh, the people can begin to to expect and understand. John Musson, CEO of Wasabi Rabbit, a digital agency located right here on Fulton Street, right at the South Street Seaport in New York City. Great to see you. Uh, and we have to say congratulations on your selection to become a rear admiral in the United States Navy. Thanks again, Ken. Always a pleasure to see you. I look forward to the next opportunity to chat. Great to see you too. This is Ken Kratzer for CBSI Services in New York.